today i'll be discussing mainly to the investigations that needs to be done in a case of chronic pain now this is such a topic that if you search the books actually there is no book that can tell you that what investigations we need to do because all are case based and it's a very wide area so whatever i made in this presentation is mostly based on the years of experience now we all know chronic pain is the most common reasons for which the patient seeks doctor's attention and when it is called a pain chronic pain when it lasts for more than 3 months or 1 month beyond the expected recovery of that disease it can have various causes ranging from arthritis to cancer mm -hmm. so it can happen because of many reasons but when we consider them we consider them in two ways one a chronic pain condition where there is a always nociceptive input so what is a nociceptive input in simple words take an example of an injury to your finger so what happens if there is finger is injured it is giving the nociceptive in input and it is passed modified and reached to your brain and that gives to a pain sensation in chronic pain two conditions might happen in one condition there might not be any nociceptive input for example if it is a phantom limb pain so where is the nociceptive input there is no limb so there is no nociceptive input but still the patient is having the pain in the affected limbs of which is actually not there so in those conditions there is a condition where it is generated by the systems which are sitting at a higher side so it is a pain which is chronic but with no nociceptive input but there may be other condition for example a rheumatoid arthritis or a cancer pain when there is a continuous nociceptive input that is persisting and causing the chronic pain so in the both cases it can happen now what are the tests we should prescribe so it is customized patient to patient and depending on the history and the examination findings we should write the investigation and in the investigations commonly we write the blood test neurophysiological studies then imaging studies diagnostic interventions and definitely screening for malignancy if we are suspecting it is a malignant origin so this screening for all malignancy may be a blood test or it may be a imaging study as well so what is our primary aim when a patient comes to find out the red flags okay and if there are red flags that whether present or not so if it is present immediately we ask for the investigation to find out what is happening if it is not there then we have some time in hand so here our target is again to find out the pathology whether they are present or not but in those cases we have time in hand so this are the you can say the basic schema by which we will be going now what are the investigations we commonly prescribe so again i told you it is not written in any book so i just gone through my emr software and i have seen so these are the investigations that i commonly write in my patients so it's a big list so let us try to summarize this list into a characterized manner so that it is classified into different sort of disorder so let's see first of all blood tests what are the blood investigations commonly asked for now first of all it's a complete blood count of the patient so how it can be helpful it can give you the idea of the hemoglobin status especially if the patient is having rheumatoid arthritis patient is on drugs he might have less hemoglobin so in lot of patients there are associated nutritional deficiencies that might reduce it 
in infection cases so when there is some infective origin is persisting in those cases there might be leukocytosis so this thing can be picked up by a complete blood count remember it is not a small list actually we get further more information from this complete blood count but details i think you have already read in ug days today my job is just to remind and link those thoughts or whatever you learned in your ug days to this current pain diagnosis now come into the liver function test in the liver function test what we commonly assess is the allylin transaminase or is also called the sgpt we all know again when we give the patient is on the anti rheumatoid drugs this is modifying anti rheumatoid drugs there is an elevation of this conditions there might be hepatitis that might elevate this conditions there may be obstructive jaundice that might elevate this conditions there may be malignancy associated jaundice or malignancy associated obstruction or malignancy inside the metastasizing in the liver so in all those conditions it is very important to check not only on this perspective because when we are going to do any procedure it is very much important to check the coagulation profile and prothrombin time is one of the parameters that we commonly check in case of before any procedure now coming to the sugar so sugar has lot of significance so we usually test all these three fasting post prandial and hba1c so if you are suspecting a case of diabetic polyneuropathy causing the pain diabetic peripheral neuropathic pain you might have to ask but remember it depends so in some countries the patients are referred to the pain physicians yet we do not have to work up from the baseline because they have already all the investigations and diagnosis is pre made but in countries like india here usually some patients are referred and some patients and i should say in my practice most of the patients is my primary patients so they are coming to me either referred to by some certain doctors or they are directly coming to me so in those cases we have to do the preliminary assessment as well next is the urea creatinine definitely it works in two ways to find out whether they are raised or not and specially we are when we are writing nsets first of all you should be very careful in writing nsets and before nsets you should always check what is the renal function of the patient now coming to the thyroid disorders or thyroid function test these are indicated in all rheumatologic disorders because it may be associated with the autoimmune at other autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or it can cause some problems for example if the patient is having hypothyroidism the patient is more prone to developing the carpal tunnel syndrome or other syndromes similarly the fibromyalgia cases are also associated with the hypothyroidism so it is very important to check the thyroid status serum uric acid another commonly done investigations so here we need to find out the uric acid level but again i should say there clinical findings is something that will guide to the investigation because in some conditions the patient might be having a normal uric acid even then the patient can come with a gout so it is very important that we should actually find out the cause behind it so these are the things but these are not the only thing okay it's a very small list so we should have to check the other things as well now primary or non specific marker of inflammation when the patient comes it is very much important for us to find out whether there is any background inflammatory pathology that is going on or not remember these are the non specific marker so it can be raised in infection it can be raised in inflammation and in some patients it can be raised without any symptoms as well so our interpretation should be cautious so if it matches with the clinical findings and we have ruled out the infection then we should work up on this basis now one of the common investigations the esr that is the electrocyte sedimentation rate that actually we all know from our ugs days and another is the prp or c reactive protein so why it is so called because it reacts with the 
capsular polysaccharide of the pneumococcus. That is why it is named as the C-reactive protein. This is synthesized by the liver in reaction to an inflammation or infection. And usually more than three times increased than the normal level is considered very severe. Now coming to the inflammatory pathologies. So in our patients, there might be a degenerative etiology, an inflammatory etiology, or a malignant etiology. There are several other etiologies like neuralgia, which doesn't fall in any of these groups, or sympathetically mediated. Again, this doesn't fall into any of these groups. But the basic structure, whether it's a degenerative disease or an inflammatory disease, that we need to make out. So if we are suspecting a case of polyarthralgia with swelling of the multiple joints, definitely the rheumatoid arthritis is beyond the scope of this course. But when you are seeing patients, it is very much important that we should know this patient is having, this picture of the patient is having the rheumatoid arthritis and we should send the patient to the respective doctors. So rheumatoid factor, one of the most commonly done investigation, they are present in about 80% people with the rheumatoid arthritis, where the specificity is 85%. It is not very specific. It can be present in some normal individual as well, but here, the sensitivity is higher among the other tests. Then come to the anti CCP or anti cisturated type of blood antibodies, which is present in about 60 to 70% of the patients with the RA. So, here the sensitivity is comparatively low, but the advantage is its specificity is very high, around 95%. So, if we are getting it positive, then there is a chance the patient is suffering or likely to be suffering from the rheumatoid arthritis. I am adding the second line because it is found that it may be raised before two years of the onset of the actual disease. Then CRP, non-specific marker for the inflammation, it is that sedimentation rate, again, non-specific marker for the inflammation. So these are the basic tests that we need to prove or disprove the rheumatoid arthritis. Coming to the spondyloarthropathies. In fact, the spondyloarthropathies at early stage, one of the most difficult disorders to diagnose. Because in those cases, sometimes all the inflammatory markers that we are talking about may be absent. So here we have a genetic testing that is the HLAB27. It's a genetic marker that is present around 90% people of the ankylosing spondylitis and around 50% patients in other forms of the Spondyloarthropathy. We all know spondyloarthropathy is a big family that includes ankylosing spondylitis, acute arthritis, reactive arthritis, and differentiated spondyloarthropathy, psoriatic arthropathy, arthritis associated with the inflammatory bowel disease, and juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So these all members are falls into the same category of the spondyloarthropathies. And here also the inflammatory markers like CRP and ESR may be raised. And in some patients, only 5 to 10 percent cases of the patient with the spondylo activity, anti-sexuated peptide antibodies might also be raised. So that is how again we can, if we are getting an inflammatory disorder and we are suspecting, then we can differentiate or we can find out this is a patient of SNA. Sorry, this is a patient of spondyloarthropathy. Similarly, another disorder. Okay, why I am telling about these three disorders because they are very common. Okay, there are other disorders in the immunology as well. Okay, but we are not discussing those things because it is not that commonly found. And if we discuss very rare thing, then we will diagnose this and it will be rarely correct. So the things are ANA, anti DSDNA, anti SM. And there is anti dough, anti la, anti phospholipid, and complement components that is actually lower response with the inflammation. So, among which the most commonly done is the ANA because, again, it is not highly specific. It can be found in the other autoimmune disorders as well, but it is comparatively more sensitive. It is actually present in more than 95% patients with the SRA. And definitely, 
here also it is the clinical finding that will guide you to the diagnosis coming to the vitamin analysis now there is a big uh, thought on the schools that whether the vitamin d causes pain or not and what is the exact level of the vitamin d so most of the studies have found if it is something between u vitaminosis we can call it's between 30 to 40 and since some studies it is slightly higher but there is a basic question that whether the vitamin d deficiency causes pain or not or how it is linked with the pain because this link is not fully established but even then there are a lot of studies that have said that as the vitamin d supplementation is very inexpensive and in some patients it might cause musculoskeletal pain so it can be the patient can be made u vitaminosis d when we are suspecting a deficit because it is true in india when we test sometimes there are a lot of patients which shows the signs of vitamin d deficiency but you are not actually having any symptoms okay that is also possible let's move to the next part now coming to the pre procedure investigations now those who are from the branch of anesthesiology for them it is actually a cake work they are doing every day but what i am telling about the minimal thing what we should require to perform and procedure so first of all it is a coagulation profile commonly btct and pti are done next it is the lutein blood cvc fasting pp and creatinine then usually we go for the chest x ray pa view and in older patient we go for the ecg and the viral markers it is for your safety okay so these are the things that is commonly done now coming to the electrophysiological tests so what is the role of the electrophysiological test and when we should write an electrophysiological test remember electrophysiological tests are mainly to detect the neuropathies and myopathies okay so if we see for the nerve conduction velocity that can be tested when the patient is giving a pain which is of a neurological spectrum then we can suspect a nerve damage or we can suspect a nerve compression or entrapment okay so it can detect the nerve entrapment syndromes like a carpal tunnel syndrome cubital tunnel syndrome radial tunnel syndrome dorsal tunnel syndrome midalgia parasitica cervical or lumbar radiculopathy and it can also be helpful in detecting the neuropathy which is originating from the diabetes may be associated with the chemotherapy induced neuropathies autoimmune disorder induced neuropathies and alcohol induced neuropathies so in those conditions it is very much beneficial it can give you a clue and usually both the sensory and the motor ncv is commonly done and we have to know these disorders and this can actually detect from where it is coming but remember now it is there is also a discussion that is going on whether it's the ultrasound which is better for the nerve entrapment or it is the nerve conduction velocity test or the electromyography test that will be better to find out a nerve entrapment so again some advantages are there in case of electrophysiology as well some advantages are there in case of ultrasound as well ultrasound it's a very easy tool to find out whereas the nerve conduction velocity is more of a functional test the nerve conduction rate the ultrasound is more of an objective test in nerve conduction velocity we can find out the informations regarding the nerve conduction but the problem is that here it takes time to develop that means at early phases when the entrapment there the nerve conduction velocity may be even normal but in when it is almost more than 3 weeks usually the changes starts appearing in the ncv as well but the problem with the ncv is that it doesn't see through the cause that means what is compressing over the nerve okay the imaging studies not only ultrasound like an mri that can actually tell whether the pressure is over the disc is pressing over the nerve or not or in case of ganglion cyst whether it is compressing on the nerve or not 
So that cause of the disease we can find out from the ultrasound or sometimes MRI or other imaging studies. So in that way, we can say they are not a competition between them, but they are actually complementing each other to find out better diagnosis. Next, coming to the imaging studies. Again, the imaging studies we use a lot in most of the patients. So what are the imaging studies? So commonly done and the cheapest one is the X-ray. X-ray is ideal for spotting the fracture, dislocation, misalignments, narrow joint space, osteophytes and other degenerative changes. So the advantage is that it is very simple test and it is a very inexpensive test. So whenever we are suspecting the cause, we can go for it. For example, for the knees, to for the staging, we usually ask for the X-rays instead of MRIs. But when we are suspecting, it's a soft tissue injury. Maybe it's a cruciate ligament or it's a meniscus. In a deeper plane, then our choice becomes the MRI. When you are suspecting, it's a soft tissue injury, but it's in a superficial plane. Maybe it's a medial collateral ligament or it's a lateral collateral ligament or it is maybe a ITB syndrome or UTBL band syndrome. In those cases, it is the ultrasound which is much easier and inexpensive and can be used. So again, X-ray is one of the simplest tools that we can get to use in case of diagnosis. Now, CT scan also depends on the principles of X-ray, but it is much better in finding out the blood clot, in finding out the bone fractures, including the fetal fractures not visible on the X-ray, and in case of organ injuries as well. So, the advantage of the CT scan is that we are getting the everything in a cross-sectional plane and we can get it better. But in certain areas, especially the posterior fossa of the brain and the soft tissues, it is always better to do the MRI. Now, if we compare with the CT scan on X-ray, so CT scan, obviously, there is the rapid acquisition of the image, whereas the X-ray, the acquisition of images is much slower. It's a technology that is a very age old. The CT scan can give you more specific information. It can scan a large portion of the body. Ability to image bones of different blood vessels all at the same time is possible with the CT scan. And whereas the X ray is mainly ability to image the bone and teeth, provide many. Detailed CT scan provides very detailed image for many types of tissues such as the lungs, bones, and blood vessels. So, in those cases, we actually prefer the CT scan over the X ray and can reveal the internal injuries leading quickly in emergency cases. It can be done by the CT scan, it is not possible by the X rays. So, X rays is a very inexpensive, quick tool, but definitely for the better scanning, we can go for the CT scanning. But again, if we see the patient perspective, then X-ray is comparatively better over the CT scans. Though the machines have improved since the early days. Now coming to the ultrasound. Now in initial days, the concept of ultrasound in musculoskeletal area was not clear. Even when we started the pain medicine in 2019, at that time also, the ultrasound was mainly used for the abdominal obstetric cases. The musculoskeletal ultrasound came comparatively late, especially in India. And definitely, if the most, they can call the Bible of the ultrasound, the Bianchi's book, it is written in 2007. So there was, in specific areas, where they have started the good quality ultrasound, that was not available worldwide. But nowadays, in our clinic, it is more important to have an ultrasound machine than a stethoscope. Because nowadays, ultrasound is the current stethoscope especially for us, for the pain physicians, because we have to find out a lot of superficial injuries, and that can be find out with the help of the ultrasound. It has a lot of advantages. One of them is that it is the non-ionizing radiation. So it can be done even in a pregnant patient. It can be done in all patients. So that's a big advantage. It is simple, inexpensive. It gives the real-time imaging. We can see the blood flow, which you cannot see in any other forms of the imaging. Next, 
you can it can be repeated so blood flow can be seen so i told it cannot be seen but it can be seen if you do the angiography and give the rise but that's a separate issue and not considering in simple way you cannot see it can see only with the ultrasound it have less artifacts is useful for evaluating the soft tissues nerve and blood vessels and useful for guiding biopsies and interventions as well so for us it's a diagnostic tool as well as it's a tool by which we can guide all our superficial investigations so for the deep areas like spine especially the lumbar spine and the other areas we can still keeping it for the fluoroscope but all other areas can be replaced by the ultrasound especially the superficial areas now coming to the mri scanning so i have made this slide a little small because we have a exclusive class on the mri scanning so mri scanning is much better in finding out the cartilage loss because especially at the deep when the ultrasound cannot go but mri can be helpful then it can be helpful in finding out the joint inflammation and especially in the knee you can say the is deep acl injury so it is very difficult because the inner portion of the acl on the anterior portion we can see with the ultrasound but the inner portion we have to depend on the mri then it can be helpful in detecting the nerve compression especially in the areas like foramina where so the reach of ultrasound because of the depth is limited so we can see actually whether it's a central foraminal stenosis or a lateral foraminal stenosis that can be actually be given the idea by the MRI and we can also see how is the ligamentum flavum whether the ligamentum flavum hypertrophy is present or not or we can again we can find out whether there is the facial atrophy present or not though there are some limitations here even with the MRI but definitely it can be used as a best tool for those cases now it can be helpful in detecting the detached torn ligaments muscle cartilage for example the meniscal tears ligament injuries achilles tendon ruptures strains and strains and rotator cuff tears but definitely superficial cuff tears can also be done with the ultrasound as well so these are the common imaging techniques that we employ for diagnosing or finding out the pathology in case of a chronic pain patient now these are the other miscellaneous investigations we sometimes prescribe so for example dexa scan for the hip and lumbar spine that is for the finding out whether there is a patient is having the osteoporosis or not serum protein electrophoresis if you are suspecting that there is a uh, increase in the m protein or you can say there is a monoclonal antibody increase so whether we to check that we can go for that then we can go for the psas then we can go for the isotope bone scanning of the skeleton so these can be helpful in different situations right now i am only saying the name because the things are it can be used in different conditions but with the disorders we will be discussing serum serum amylase lipase for a case of chronic pancreatitis serum uric acid i have already told you p1 and p that is mainly for the osteoporosis prognosis management that means when we are going for the osteoporosis therapy quantifying tb gold test tuberculin skin test if you are thinking of giving a biologics before that we should check these things no this is an example case so a case of headache so what we can prescribe remember it is not that in all patients will be prescribing everything say it's a migraine all the symptoms are suggesting of a migraine case and there is no acute exacerbation no change in nature character intensity of the pain so in those cases we will not definitely go for so so many uh, investigation so it should be selected on case to case basis now complete blood count thyroid function test esr crp which are the not specific markers of inflammation we can check the sugar levels serum electrolytes blood urea nitrogen ana odometer factor then hiv alliance antibodies lumbar puncture so these are the all tests that we might have to go similarly for the headache we can go for the x ray of the skull and the cervical spine again in x ray we can rule out certain pathologies but not all in ct scan it is better for the fractures and paranasal sinus collections and some intracranial lesions mri definitely gives a better visualization and we can go for the mri venography or angiography if required sometimes 
Even in trigeminal neuralgia, I found some aberrant vessels. Even the aberrant vertebral artery that is coming and it is so dilated, it is completing over the trigeminal nutrient tissue. These things can all be taken up by the MRI angiography. Now coming to the diagnostic intervention. Remember, whatever I told till in the general investigation part, that is actually done by all physicians. It's not the pain physicians doing the same for the diagnosis, but the other physicians, the primary care field physicians, they are doing. But diagnostic in intervention is something that is actually exclusive for the pain physician. So what is a diagnostic intervention? So anyone having any idea? Let's... Anyone? Giving local anesthesia before giving uh, steroid or neuroablation. Okay. So it is not the local anesthetic only. Actually, what we try to find out. Okay. See, our assumption is that suppose it's a spine, and in the spine, we are suspecting this area. Okay, let me do one thing. So here we are suspecting, suppose this sacroiliac joint is pain. So it is not always a nerve. First of all, we are suspecting a joint is paining. So what we can do? We can inject a local anesthetic in the joint. Suppose a disc, we are suspecting this disc is causing the pain. So what we can do? We can put a needle and we can increase the pressure of the disc by injecting normal saline into it. So we are provoking the pain. So these are the some actions by which we are trying to either replicate the pain and to find out this is a pain generator or we are trying to, we are giving local anesthetic and we are trying to get the relief to that structure or sometimes the nerve supply to that structure. So it can be called like that. So this is exclusive for the pain physicians. That is not done by in any other branches. So, in diagnostic intervention, it is very important to be precise. So, all diagnostic interventions should be guided. It should not be a blind intervention. Now, in diagnostic intervention, to be sure, what can be done? Now, coming to the, say, drug volume. So should we give a less volume of the drug or should we give more volume of the drug for the diagnostic intervention? Any idea? Less volume. Yes. It's true that we will be giving a small volume of the drug. Let us take the example of a facet giant drug. So facet joint, as I told, either can be blocked going in the facet joint itself, that is the intraarticular block, or it can be blocked by giving the local anesthetic to its nerve supply. So you all know, here in case of this facet joint, the nerve supply is like this. So suppose this is the facet joint we are trying to evaluate. So what we can do? Either we can go directly to this joint and then inject here. Okay, And then we inject here at this point. Or what we can do? Instead of going directly to the joint, we can block the nerve supplies. So the nerve supplies are like this. From above, it is coming. From above, one nerve is coming like this. These are the median branches. They are reaching to this joint. And from below, one nerve is reaching to this joint. It is dividing and going to the lower branch as well. Similarly, from here also, one is going and going here. Now, from where these are coming? These are coming from the nerve roots. So, if we say this is the nerve root or this is the nerve root, from this root they are coming. Now, these we all know anatomical locations of this median branches are at the junction of the superior articular facet and the transverse facet. So, if we put the needle 
and we go there at the junction of this superior articular facet and the transverse facet, and we give a local anesthetic, the patient will be feeling pain relief for this giant. Now, if we give more volume on the drug, the chances of pain relief will be more. But the problem is we do not have control over the spread of the drug. So this drug, what we are injecting for this median branch, might spread to this root or this root. So when it's gone to the root, it will again come, can come to the epidural space. So it will ultimately may become an epidural anesthesia and our diagnostic efficacy will be lost. Similarly, in case of a selective nerve root block, where the nerve block is given at the nerve root to find out whether the pain is coming from the nerve root. So again, if in those conditions, if we give more drug, it will spill over to the other nerve roots because from the epidural space, they are connected. So it will, from this root, it will come to that root. So the diagnostic efficacy will be lost. So in those cases, drug volume is restricted to 0.5 ml. And usually the 1% local anesthetic is used because that is the concentration for the sensory blockage. So one thing we can do, to make the accuracy more is the limit the drug volume. You understood the concept of limiting the drug volume in case of diagnostic block? Or someone still having some confusion? Okay. Can you explain, I, sir, once again? I am, yes, this is very important because this concept is what on which the basic pain medicine has started. Then now it has gone to a long way. But the basic concept was that in MRI or CT scan, what is found that in lot of patients, there are changes in the facet joint. But they, these patients are not having any symptoms. There are some instances when there is pain in the facet joints, but pain over the paraspinal area, but in MRI, it is showing absolutely normal value. And in low back pain and other or some kinds of pain like snake pain, okay, this is a very common fact that we are not finding out any source or we have found out the source, but it is not matching with the source. This is very common. So why, how can we go about this? For this, these diagnostic blocks are invented. So we know what are the pain generators in a lumbar spine. Now, what we are doing? We are suspecting that this structure might be causing the pain. So we can do two ways. For example, if we suspect that this facet joint is causing the pain, either we can go inside the facet joint or inject local anesthetic inside it, 0.5 ml, and come and ask the patient if your pain is relieved or not. So it can make the exact diagnosis because pain is something that is experienced by the patient. It cannot be measured by any objective investigations. Say it's X-ray, MRI, ultrasound, they can see only the structure, but they cannot see the pain. So if we inject and ask the patient whether the pain is relieved or not, if the patient is saying that after injecting this local anesthetic to this specific joint, my pain is decreased, then our conclusion will be that this joint is pencil. Clear? Till this part clear, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, or in case we can do another approach that instead of going to that joint, we can block the nerve supply to this joint. Okay? We can block the nerves going to that joint. So we are putting local anesthetic over that nerve. And we are asking the patient whether your pain is relieved or not. If the patient gives the positive result that, yes, my pain is relieved, then we can confirm definitely that this joint was canceled. This is causing the pain. So whatever MRI is telling, it is maybe wrong, maybe true. Okay? Even in normal MRI, sometimes if the pain persisting, we can go for the diagnostic blocks. Okay, and if there is no pain, we are finding a disease on MRI. There is no point of doing a block. Okay, so all depends on the symptoms because pain is something that cannot truly give you the clue. 
In lot of MRIs, if you see in an age of 40 or 50, there are a lot of disc bulges, but they are asymptomatic. There are a lot of acetal changes. They are also asymptomatic. So in those conditions, we will not go on the basis of MRI and we should do the radio frequency evaluation. Our concept is that we do find out the source of the pain. But definitely, if there is a malignancy or there is a COX TB, okay. So in those cases, we have to immediately start, start the treatment according to the pathology. But here, when we are finding or suspecting a degenerative disease, we should not go for it. And you know, in lumbar spine, a lot of patients actually falls between it because the MRI is not matching with their symptoms. So there is no surgery can be done or the MRI is showing there is absolutely normal or there are no changes in the MRI, but still the pain is persisting. That all the three conditions might happen. So here, my next point, so you have understood the diagnostic block, but the next point is the volume of the diagnostic block. How much local anesthetic should we inject? We should inject the more amount or less amount. That I was trying to explain just a few minutes before. But here we should be limiting our local anesthetic amount and it should be usually for the lumbar spine in the areas. Area to area it depends and varies that we'll be discussing along with the disorders. But here we should be limiting our dose to a standard dose that is the 0.5 ml so that it doesn't spill so far to other structures and it doesn't give a false positive result. Okay. Say we have drinking block here and we have given 10 ml of the local anesthetic. So local anesthetic will spill over this nerve roots. Okay. And here definitely it will give the pain relief. But the problem might be somewhere else. It might be a radiculopathy. That's why the pain was occurring. But we have given in the median branch. Now I am thinking that it is the, I have relieved the radicular, it is a median branch that is the causing the problem. It's not the radiculopathy. So that's why the volume should be reduced. Those are actually first time seeing me in a pain management course. So they might be seeing is a little bit difficult for the first day. But you just keep those things in mind. So when we'll go to the back pain and other areas, this concept will be much more clear to you. Similarly, there is another concept that is known as the dual diagnostic block. Okay. So why we are doing the dual diagnostic block? The concept of dual diagnostic block came because in some conditions it happened that the diagnostic block has given the pain relief. But when we have done the radio frequency ablation or a definitive procedure there, but even then it is not getting a confirmed result. So people have thought, let us do one thing. Because, you know, pain is not a sensation or a phenomenon of the periphery. The central systems are always involved. And sometimes it might happen. The pain is created by the central system. Okay. The upper systems. In fact, in one of my patients have actually mimicked a complete radiculopathy. And their diagnostic block, we are not finding anything. So to find out in those days what I have to do, I have to put a catheter and I have to do an epidural anesthesia. And what I found, you will be surprised. The patient is still having the pain, though the pain, legs are not moving with the anesthesia. So these cases actually prove that it is not only the peripheral force that is causing the pain, but sometimes it might happen. But our central structures may be disordered, having disorder, and that is causing the pain. And you do not, please do one thing, that is do not call them as a psychiatric patient. Okay, That is a very common concept or mistake which was there for years. Now it is central pain or centrally originating pain is a very known entity. It may be associated with the emotional disorders, but it is not a psychiatric pain. Okay, So it is a disorder of the pain pathway at the higher part. It may be associated with the limbic system because they are all interconnected. Next is the, I was discussing the concept of dual diagnostic block from where I've deviated. So what is the dual diagnostic block? The concept again, because of that, let's see, there might be a placebo action that the eye doctor has done something to my back. That's why I'm getting the relief. So that might be happening for the patient. So let us do one thing. Instead of calling the patient one day, I'll be calling the patient two days. In one day, I'll be blocking with the lignocaine. And the next day, I'll be blocking with the bupivacaine and opira. So that the duration of the local anesthetics are different. So here what will happen? 
that the for the d when i have given the link okay the print relief will be of short duration the d when i will be giving the again the pain relief of will be of a comparatively longer duration. So by that way, you will be able to differentiate whether the, any other central pain is existing or not. Because the placebo action and all the other factors will be the same for both the cases. So if we are not getting this differential duration of the relief, you will be not sure. So in those cases, we will be more sure that this passive joint or that very structure is causing the pain. So this concept was good. But only problem is the economics. Because calling the patient three times, why three times? For a first diagnostic block, second diagnostic block, and a different ablation or any other definitive procedure. It is, first of all, cumbersome for the patient. And economically, it is not viable. Okay, Especially if you are in a government institute or an institute where the patient don't have to bear any, any price from, from the pocket, it may be possible. But the advantage what we got from those is not actually that much to continue this dual diagnostic block. So nowadays, it is usually the single diagnostic block that is done. Dual diagnostic block is gone to a disfavor. But still, if we say for the accuracy part of view, it is definitely the dual diagnostic block is comparatively better than a single diagnostic block. Next. I have already taken this example of the facet joint median branch block. So these joints of the spine on the back of the spine are the very common source of pain. And these nerves are supplying this joint. So if we put local anesthetic here and we ask the patient whether the pain is relieved or not for a joint, see for this joint, we'll be putting one here, one here. Okay. So it is the junction of the secular articular facet and the transverse process here also. And we ask the patient, if the patient gives the pain relief, which is more than 50%, then we are sure that it might be coming from the passive channel. Similarly, this concept continues for the sympathetic blocks as well. That means if we are suspecting, it's a lower length CRPS. Okay? So the complex regional pain syndrome of the lower length. And that is causing the pain. So for that we can do, we can go for a lumbar sympathetic block. So we can go to the lumbar sympathetic chain, and we can give local anesthetic. Definitely the volume is different here. Here we are much away from the narrow and the volume here we have to give around usually two to three ml in each level. Or if you are doing a single level, we can give a comparatively higher volume. But again, we will be checking the drug distribution as well. So, but again, here we will be doing another trick, we'll be reducing the concentration of the drug because we all know 0.5. Uh, this milligram, uh, this percent of the lignocaine is actually the concentration for blocking the sympathetic system. So we can give a reduced concentration of the drug. So these are the actually techniques by which we can definitely say it is coming from the sympathetic, not from any other nerves. Because for the sensory, the usual concentration is around 1% of the lignocaine. So instead of giving 1%, in this lumbar sympathetic, we have given the 0.5%. And the volume, as the chain is comparatively larger, you have to give slightly more. But if it gives relief, that means the pain is sympathetically mediated. Okay. So these are all the examples of the diagnostic block. Similarly, till now, we have told about the local anesthetic injection only. But local anesthetic injection is not only consideration. Because in some conditions, like when there is the pain is coming from the disc, we call it a discogenic pain. Now, in case of discogenic pain, to prove that this disc is painful, what we do? We artificially, with the help of an instrument called the discometer, we go inside the disc and then we increase the intradiscal pressure. And by increasing the intradiscal pressure, we try to provocate the pain. Okay, again, it's a big chapter, but remember this I have put here only to say you that it is not only the local anesthetic injection, but pain provocation under a controlled environment can also be a part of a diagnostic intervention. And provocative discography is one of such examples of a diagnostic intervention to find out disc as a pain generator. Now coming to the diagnostic interventions for different areas. So what are the common diagnostic intervention that is done for the headache disorders. Remember, it is not only the diagnostic interventions. You have to, when 
we are actually doing that, evaluating the case, we should start from the history and depending on that, we should perform. So these are the examples of the diagnostic intervention, what we'll be doing for the headache. So commonly for the occipital neuralgia, we can do for the greater and lesser occipital nerve block as per our suspicion. For the trigeminal neuralgia, we can go for the trigeminal ganglion block or in case of the cancers in the facial area, we can go for the trigeminal ganglion block. For the cluster headache or phenopalatine neuralgia, we can go for the phenopalatine ganglion block. For the cervicogenic headache, mainly originating from the C2-C3 median branch arthropacid arthropathy, we can go for the C2-C3 medial branch block. It is not because of the medial branch, but because of the facet joint. Now, cervical epidural, if there is the radiculopathy, trigger point injections, if you are suspecting is of myofascial pain syndrome. So these are only names because today we'll be learning this, but definitely with time, with the specific chapter, we'll be learning everything. Now for the neck pain, what diagnostic interventions can be done? Cervical medial branch block, especially for the cervical facet pains. Now this can be done both under ultrasound and both under fluoroscope. For a long time, it has been done under fluoroscope only, but now it is in ultrasound. We can beautifully see the nerves and we can plot with the help of the ultrasound as well. So, cervical medial nerve branch block in case of cervicogenic headache due to the facet joint atropathy, diagnostic selective nerve root block, then cervical epidural injections and trigger point injections. So, this can be done for the upper cervical pains. Now, upper back pain. We can go for the trigger point injection. In some cases, we can go for the thoracic medial branch block. We can go for the intracostal nerve block in case of suspected post herpetic neuralgia. It is very common and other disorders affecting these areas. We can go for the cervical epidural in case of internal disruption for radiculopathies. And in case of thoracic, we can go for the thoracic injections. Okay. Now coming to the lumbar area. Remember, lumbar area is a big area for the pain physician because of the most of our patients are having this a common area where the most of the patients come. So what may be the pain generators? It may be a facet causing facet joint arthropathy. It may be spondyloresis, that is the slip of the one vertebra over the other that is causing either the foraminal stenosis or it may cause the facet joint arthropathies causing the pain. So it could also be find out with the diagnostic block. There may be nerve root compression either due to disc herniation or due to spondylolisthesis or due to foraminal stenosis or due to fascicle arthropathy or due to ligamentum flammam hypertrophy or due to fascicle cysts. So these are all conditions that can increase the, that cause the compression of the nerve roots and that can give features of the radiculopathy. The pain may be because of the disc, which is when it is only for the inside the disc. The disc is not herniated, but inside the disc, the disc has become sensitive. It is known as the discogenic pain. That can be the cause of the pain. Or if there is the disc herniations or disc bulging that is compressing over the nerve root or causing inflammation around the nerve root, that can also cause the pain. Next is the vertebral compression. In low back pain, there may be sacroiliac joint inflammation. There may be. So these are the all conditions for which we need to go for the diagnostic blocks. And commonly diagnostic blocks done are the trigger point injections, lumbar medial branch blocks, lumbar intraarticular facet joint blocks. So there is a, this we will discuss in detail in the back pain section, but which one is better, both can be done. But in for, for, for prognostic value, the medial branch block is better. But we'll be discussing in detail. Sacroiliac injection we'll be discussing. We'll be demonstrating in the mannequin as well all these procedures. Selective nerve root infection and the infla injection and the provocative discography. So in the lumbar area, in the basic course, we'll try to cover everything. Now, diagnostic blocks for the sympathetically mediated pain. So in which areas we can actually do the diagnostic block? For the pain in the upper extremities, pain in the facial areas, if you are suspecting it's a sympathetic origin, we can go for the steroid ganglion block. We can go for the titular sympathetic block for the same reason. There are two conditions where we can choose titular 3 over the steroid ganglion 
Number one, if we want to do a neurolysis, which is not possible in the steroid ganglia, but can be done at the level of the sympathetic block. And in some patients where the nerve of Coombs, that is an apparent connection, it is present between the tetrutrisy area and the upper extremity, bypassing the steroid ganglia. In those cases, we can go for the tetrutrisy sympathetic block. Celiac plexus block for the upper abdominal malignancies, splattering nerve block also for the upper abdominal malignancies and for the chronic pancreatitis pain as well. Lumbar sympathetic block for the lower abdominal sympathetic immediate pain and sympathetic blocks are also done for the vasospastic disorders. So for the vasospastic disorders and ischemia of the upper extremity may be a first bite, we can go for the steroid ganglion. For the lower limb, we can go for the lumbar sympathetic block. Now coming for the chronic pelvic pain, which is sympathetically mediated, we can go for the superior hypogastric plexus blocks and for the pain at the perineum and coccyx, we can go for the ganglia of infrared. So these are the all sympathetic blocks what is done in the human being. Now again, this procedures mostly will be describing in throughout the course in different disorders. So that was all about the overview of the investigations. But remember, this overviews are a little bit difficult because we are touching a lot of areas in a small presentation. But it is very important. We should read it and see this video many times throughout this week. Otherwise, it will be very difficult because uh, our accent is a little fast, especially compared to the other countries. So you might feel a diff little difficulty in initially understanding, but definitely when you see the video three, four, five times, then definitely all the things you will grab. And in the next classes, when you'll be describing the things in more detail, we'll be describing the specific things. It will be very easy for you. Now, if you have any question regarding this presentation, you can ask me. Excuse yes. me, sir. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for the lovely presentation. Could you give me some examples of sympathetically mediated pain? Okay. See, any pain that is originating to the sympathetic chain, for example, a complex regional pain syndrome, the pain which is, I am having is because of a sympathetically origin. Okay. So these pains are the sympathetically mediated pains. Okay, thank you so much.